everyone, and welcome to today's webinar launch for NCI's Travel Food Sovereignty Case Study on the San Carlos Apache Tribe. My name is Sadie Reddingwell. I'm an enrolled member of the Oto Missouri Tribe of Indians, and I serve as a research associate here at NCAI. So before we get into our formal welcoming, I wanted to provide some housekeeping notes for today's webinar. So because we only have an hour with everyone today, we'll be asking attendees to utilize the chat box function and the questions function for today's questions. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please identify when submitting your question, or if it is for all panelists or both panelists in this section, uh, please just say both. And lastly, if we have, if you have any follow-up questions or thoughts about today's webinar, please feel free to email us at foodsovereignty at nci.org. And with that, I'll pass it on over to Ian Recker to open us up. Ian, take it away. Thank you so much, Sadie. And, and thank you to Sadie and Ashley for uh, being such important um, contributors to NCAI's uh, Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative. Uh, my name is Dr. Ian Record. I serve as uh, Vice President of Tribal Governance and Special Projects at NCAI, which includes um, the Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative. Uh, next slide, please. And we're really pleased today to um, launch uh, what is the third in a set of five uh, case studies chronicling um, what we feel to be uh, among the leading practices, the best practices uh, in tribal food sovereignty across Indian country. Um, in 2019, we released our first case study on the Yurok tribe in uh, Northern California. Uh, recently, we released our case study in, on the United Nation in Wisconsin. And in the coming uh, month, we'll be releasing our case studies on the Osage Nation in Oklahoma and the Blackfeet Nation in Montana. Um, in addition to um, these case studies, we've done a lot of other things under the um, Tribal Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative banner over the last uh, year, year plus. Um, and that includes um, last year we held four uh, policy, policy symposiums um, on, uh, that, that looked at the nexus between food sovereignty and four key policy areas, uh, agriculture, land, uh, water, and climate change. Um, and those helped to inform a couple of policy uh, briefs, the first of which is focused uh, specifically on the Farm Bill. Um, it looks at both um, implementation of the tribal provisions in the 2018 Farm Bill, and then also looks ahead to the 2023 Farm Bill and begins to outline what are some of the emerging priorities of tribal nations and individual food producers uh, for that major piece of legislation that is renewed every five years. Um, next week at our uh, NCAI's Executive Council Winter Session, which is our annual uh, DC-based event, we're going to be releasing a two-page brief that um, in very uh, concise terms lays out what we feel to be the leading um, policy recommendations, funding recommendations for the federal government um, to uh, undertake that will help empower um, tribal food sovereignty, food production, and food security efforts. Um, and this is both at the tribal nation level, the tribal organizational level, and then at the individual native food producer or food harvester level as well. Um, also recently, we released a uh, resource directory for uh, tribal nations and individual food producers that collates in a single document all of the available funding and other types of sources of support that are available um, to those that are engaged in food sovereignty, food security, and food production efforts. Um, these, these include, you know, uh, opportunities from USDA, Department of Interior, but also non-federal sources of support. So those foundation and other entities that are out there supporting um, Indian country in this arena. And we wanted to put all that information in, in a single place. That's available on our website. Uh, we'll be sharing the links to those um, in, our, in the chat. And um, we'll be updating that directory on a monthly basis moving forward to make sure that it's got all the latest and greatest information about um, funding and other sources of support for, for folks like you that are attending this webinar that are looking for additional resources um, to help you in your, in your efforts. Uh, and then we're also excited about something that we have coming down the pike, which is um, we're going to be working over the next year uh, to develop a comprehensive online resource center uh, for tribal nations and individual food producers that among other things, um, brings together not just NCI resources, but resources that have been, have been 
uh, produced by others that showcase leading tribal approaches from across Indian country in this arena, um, the latest data, uh, toolkits, um, things like you know the, what the leading research is in, in this arena and so forth. And so we're really excited and to learn more about all of this work, you can go to the, the um, Food Sovereignty Advancement Initiative webpage on NCI's website. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm, I'm truly excited uh, to um, now introduce our panelists. Um, I, I worked with them closely in developing this case study. Um, went out there about a year ago to the San Carlos Apache tribe in, uh, in central eastern Arizona uh, to learn uh, directly on the ground about the incredible work that they're doing and have been doing for going on uh, 30 years. And um, it was a bit of a homecoming of sorts for me uh, in that I've been working with the San Carlos Apache tribe uh, for close to 25 years now on, um, on ethno history uh, and it, uh, efforts um, and, and related efforts around um, strengthening tribal governance and showcasing um, some of the cutting edge work that Seth and Twyla and others there at the tribe have been doing for, for quite some time. Um, so with that, I, I'd, like, I'd like to turn the floor over now to Twyla um, to uh, and, and Seth to provide us an overview of the traditional Western Apache uh, diet project. Twyla, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, welcome everybody and thank you for having us be on this panel and I'm going to let Seth here. <laughs> Hello. Um, hi, my name is Seth Pilsk and like Twyla said, we're part of a project that goes back 30 years. And in that 30 years we've been working, us and a group of people have been working with elders here at San Carlos on the White Mountain Apache Reservation and the Camp Verde Apache Reservation. And most of that work has been working with very knowledgeable people and learning about the traditional Apache relationship with the natural world. And I think we're ready to start the presentation. Yeah. So the first part of the presentation, you'll be hearing a lot from me. And then the last part, you'll be hearing a lot from Twyla. So just to warn you. But just as a little background, the traditional Apache relationship with the natural world is extremely involved, intense, and personal. And the whole traditional Apache way of life is really governed by this concept that they call gojon. And that means that it's a happiness that derives from the complete balance and harmony between an individual, themselves, their family, their community, and the natural world. And they see that relationship as all encompassing and vital. And they see that the relationship is, is um, it's one-on-one -on -one and it goes both ways. So if the land is healthy, the people are healthy. And if the people are unhealthy, the land is unhealthy. It's a reciprocal relationship. And it informs almost everything about traditional Apache culture. And the other thing is that traditional culture is completely sustainable. It really is about living as lightly on the land as possible and working very consciously to keep the land just perfect, just the way God made it. And when you think about it, that takes a huge commitment and a lot of knowledge. And that's where this project has been taking us. Next slide, please. When we started so many years ago, learning about the food, it started with an elder who was born around 1900 and was raised by his grandparents who grew up before the reservation. And he just said very simply, if the people ate their own food and lived the life that supported eating that food, they and the country would be healthy again. And we just really took that as a cue to really study what he meant. And that's been really um, dominating our work for the past decades. Next, please. And again, I'll give you some more background before you hear from Twyla. But at San Carlos and White Mountain, there are real uh, epidemics going on. There's a physical health epidemic, which is very intense. Over half the population is obese. And there are high rates of cancer and diet-related illnesses. But there's also epidemics of substance abuse, 
suicide, attempted suicide and cutting, and um, sexual violence. And all of these got their start in the early days of the reservation. Next, please. And before the reservation, Apaches lived this life of living lightly on the land. Those traditional people knew every element of the natural world. They knew every rock, every kind of cloud, every kind of bird and every plant. They knew what kind of prayer it had, what kind of song it had, and what kind of power it had. And they really built their lives around having a good reciprocal relationship with each and every element of that natural world. Next, please. And that came to an abrupt halt in many ways because of the reservation. And the government enforce very harsh conditions on the reservation to keep Apaches off of their traditional lands to open those lands up to white commercial interests. And Apache people today, while they retain so much of their traditional culture, are also suffering the effects of those harsh policies to this day. Next, please. And so that brings us to food, which is where Twyla is, really lives. And she's gonna kind of bring us up to date on some of that. Okay. So when you're looking through the reservations or a lot, of, a lot of the communities on reservations, you're going to go into a lot of the supermarkets that are located here. And a lot of them are places that are low in fiber, high in saturated fat, um, high in cholesterol, high in sodium and added sugars. It's also high in processed food. And those are pretty much your number one sellers. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, yes. Next. So 24% of the adults formerly diagnosed with diabetes, um, over 50, again, 50%, more than 50% are overweight, obese, including children. Next, please. Okay. So since, two, since 2011, we have created a database of information on traditional Apache diet, conducted and analyzed information from hundreds of interviews with Apache elders and traditional cultural authorities, detailed information regarding close to 300 food species, compiled 96 eight per month sample pre-reservation Apache daily menus. Next. Yeah, this is just an example. We worked with a botanist and researcher in Tucson named Leticia McCoon, who's really, really pretty brilliant. And we gave her information about these preservation menus. And from that, she was actually able to do a nutritional analysis and quantify at, uh, nutritional aspects of the diet. Next. So you're looking at how wild food, wild plant food made up 40 to 60% of the Total diet, agricultural food made 25 to 50% of the total diet, wild meat, 20, 40% of the total diet. The most important food by volume is the traditional diet where the roasted agave hearts, emery oak acorns, wild seeds, primary sunflower family, mustards and grasses, corn and meat. Next, please. There are over 200 documented Apache edible wild plant species comprising of green seeds, nuts, fruits, roots, tubers, stalks, flowers, fungi, and minerals. Our traditional agriculture is centered on several varieties of corn, a few varieties of squash, and rarely beans. Beans was introduced. We ate about 30 species of mammals, mostly rodents by volume, nine main species of birds, supplemented by several species of songbirds. Next. Yeah, so, and I will say that um, Twyla has really devoted her life to learning about all of those species. And she is probably at this point, the single person that knows the most about those ancestral Apache foods. The other thing about the, the findings of that nutritional analysis is that we found that the diet just from a nutritional aspect is super healthy. So it's high in fiber and protein. They're like twice the USDA recommended guidelines. It's low in saturated flat, fats, healthy, uh, high in healthy fats, low in cholesterol, low in sodium. In fact, they use some salt for cooking, but they probably use salt more for prayer than for food. It's high in a lot of vitamins, 
and minerals, which is a real change from today. And it's also sweet without processed sugars. So there were a lot of sweet things to eat all throughout the year, but they were natural sugars. And that coupled with a high fiber diet meant that the body absorbed the sugar slowly. So it did not contribute to diabetes, which was unknown before the reservation. And the diet's also rich in a wide variety of whole and wild foods. And these are filled with phytonutrients that scientists are only discovering now but we know that they're very active in fighting diseases, including cancer. And the other thing about wild food is it's very filling with very little volume. Next, please. So we were really excited about these nutritional findings, but what we found quickly is that it meant very little to community members. And in fact, that whole perspective of looking at food in terms of technology and analysis, the way we've been describing it up to now, did not resonate with the community at all. In fact, the people that were most excited about it were white government healthcare workers and people like that. Uh, it wasn't something that was very important to the community, but Twyla knew all along what was important to the community and what resonated with community members and elders. So we're looking at how the diet is seasonal and that's what really worked with a lot of people here is because of the seeds and it really ties everybody in with the seasons trying, let's see you here, tying the whole community to the natural rhythm of the earth cycle, which is really exciting for me when you know what's coming up or what plant species coming up or what animals to go hunting for. It just triggers, something triggers and you just get so excited. It's not the fact that it's healthy. It's not the fact that it's nutritious. You know, it's the fact that it's just a part of life. Next, please. Yes. You can talk about that more. Yeah, so we're talking about like how everything you see on this screen here is seasonal and every year is different. This is a, this is a basic graph, but you're looking at the seasonal and you'll always have something different and it's always something exciting. Every every event is so exciting. So next please. So the traditional Apache relationship with food is deeply personal, respectful and spiritual. And I'm going to just only talk about myself. I can always, I usually use myself for, for sharing a lot of these things is for myself is how, how you, how you can say is like um, food sovereignty, you know, it's not being dependent on nobody, but mother earth herself and having that respect for her so she can take care of me. And it's something that really, really helped me with my healing process. I'm um, talking on a view of when we're talking about mental health and physical health and, and all these different aspects that a lot of healthcare providers look at. And also in recovery, I myself am, am uh, in, uh, have been in recovery 19 years now. And I've healed a lot through harvesting a lot and regaining that connection with my relatives, which are the plants, the birds and animals, and having my family be supporters in that process helped me heal and helped me reconnect and really define myself as who I am. I'm an Apache, I'm a beautiful Apache person and I am rooted to the land that I walk on. And I'm very, very, you know, when you see young people go out and feel that same thing, they heal and maybe not the same way that I do, but you see something beautiful happen to people with real healing when you apply this method. And it's a method that is not really accepted in a lot of health professions, but it's effective in native communities. So thank you. Okay. So these are all the activities we have going. We have year round Apache language and culture curriculum. And it's all again, based on those seasons, nutritional analysis and diet and fitness plans are being developed. We have field trips throughout the year, which um, Ian Sun had uh, a privilege of being part of and it was so exciting. He needs to come back out and do that hunt, complete that hunt with us. Can you tell him about the adopted 
Oh, we'll have the agave roast with the community. I know we have this pandemic going on, but we're working around things. So we're going to be having our agave roast this summer. We're going to have several field trips, our natural world information, health literacy, Facebook recipes, posts, seeds, and natural gardens. We got nat gardens going up this year. You have a lot of people having the concern about food security for one. And you're seeing them, a lot of people asking for a lot of seeds this year. Can and you tell them how you target houses and give seeds? Oh, yes. And the method of doing this um, seeds is not saying, oh, we're having a class. Let's come over to this building and let's sit and talk about planting and gardening. And my, the method that I myself use is just going out to community. I have a lot of seeds and I go out to community and there's people that, are never visited or are not recognized in communities are either not accepted in some communities. And those are the homes that I go to that don't seek services in our healthcare profession and are part of this community. So those are the people I target. And I go to their houses and we just have this conversation, you know, this great conversation about whatever. And a lot of it is geared towards planting. And you're seeing the transition of some people actually cleaning their complete yard that they have never seen before and planting a garden. And these are people that have never been visited by any healthcare profession or any uh, recovery profession. But through planting, there's a connection going on. There's something that sparked where, where they, I don't know how to explain it, but just giving out seeds to people and seeing them plant it. And when coming back in about, a couple of months and seeing all these things that they grew, you know, those beautiful plants all over the place. And they're so happy to share these plants and fruits and vegetables and squash and all these nice things in their gardens. But it's not, it's a, it's just, I, I call it a realistic approach to a lot of things. And I really appreciate and thank you for your time and allow me to just speak. <laughs> yeah, next. Next, please. So again, I go back to this, the beautiful map is Acorn Nation, Chichil, and it's really prized by Apache people, Western Apache people. When you look at the map, it really roots us to who we are as people of the land and to the landscape and why we love this um, acorn. And you look at the second map, the second map pretty much covers the original boundaries of Western Apache people. And you look at the, with the green on it, those are emery oak acorn. They are the only species in this world that you will find in those locations. You will not find them anywhere in the world. That's how rooted we are to these areas of this land because this is what sustain us, provides for us. There's so much deeper stories with acorn when they're used in ceremonies, when they're used for, you know, helping feed people, you know, so it's very connected to the land and reconnecting people to these land locations through this clan. We're working with another project and we're working with the clan, clan um, how you call it? Reconnecting people to their clans and taking them there but also incorporating using food, you know, as a, as a way to connect to the land and for them to harvest and cook and prepare. So it's pretty exciting. So we've got a lot of great things going on out this way. Thanks. Okay, next. Yeah, so Ian was talking about best practices and we had to, we don't analyze ourselves too much. So we tried to think of what the best practices were. So we came up with these strategies and what we decided, like Twyla said, the classroom doesn't work for this. It kind of makes it dead. So we really focus on making sure that we focus the education on coming naturally while doing outdoor seasonal activity, traditional things, which are mostly food based. Next. And then making sure that it's a direct connection to the land through actual experience and tying a person through their family and clan to the activity they're doing to make it very personal. Next. And maybe you can describe that. So like for myself, this is one of the locations we're talking about clan. 
And this is a place called for Narastosan. And this is a place where my mother's family's from. And we always look at our maternal side of, of who and where we're from and how we're connected to this place and why we are Apaches and why we are who we are. And it really helped me in my healing process throughout my healing time is just to be part of, to, to be in this place where it just was so beautiful. That's all I can say. And we find that taking people to where their clan is from is a really powerful thing. And then it, it makes is. things like harvesting where your DNA is from. Meaningful, yeah. very meaningful. Next, please. And then we don't focus on things like what the healthcare workers call prevention. In fact, we try to come at it from the positive way. So instead of teaching people about tobacco cessation, we want to actually promote traditional use of tobacco. So there's always that positive thing. We, we don't want to say, don't do this, don't do this. We just want to present information and skills that out compete those negative things. We want to give them something which is better than meth. And sometimes going to where your clan is from can do that. Next. And same thing, instead of teaching people about diabetes, we would rather just teach them what the healthy foods are so they don't get it in the first place or they reverse the, sym the symptoms of it. Next. And you, maybe you can describe of how you teach. Education. Yeah, so, so like for the educational part is, it's so exciting. I mean, Ian Sun can probably really talk about this section. <laughs> But it's taking people outside, taking young people outside. Some of them have never been outside hunting or they've been outside, but they never experienced the hunting, the foraging, the gathering, the cooking, the collecting of water, all these different things that they do outside. It opens up all their senses. When you're in a class and you're only focusing one way, when you're out there learning about the plants and the language, the mountain, the scenery, the cactus, the fruit, you're using all your senses, like the young people that are standing there, is how do we get this? It's a little beautiful glushcha, it's a little one pounder that after you cook it, it's a one pounder animal that you get to eat. And they are mindful of, there's cactuses all around this place. They're opening all their senses, being aware and helping each other to, to really complete this, this task of collecting dinner. So, but it's really exciting to, to see it taught in a whole different way. And it's a very effective and proven method. Everybody that has participated in this has shared many stories with their families. They've gone home and talk about it. It's also brought back a lot of stories and memories to elders that, that seen their grandchildren they participate and experience in this. And it always reflect back to where you say, I'm gonna take this up a minute. It's like grabbing this dusty old book off the shelf and you see grandma, auntie, uncle, whoever go. Cause this, this information was sat so long, they dust it off and they say, oh, we used to hunt it like this. We used to cook it like this. We, these are stories that are sitting for decades on the shelf because it didn't, it didn't um, fit into the, today's world. I'll put this back on. So, this is a very exciting way of teaching young people. So next. And again, it's infusing the community with ancestral knowledge and meaningful approaches. So incorporating the both, it really adds a lot. It really brings a lot to a person to wanting to learn and wanting to forge and wanting to cook these traditional foods or using these methods with their family. Okay, next. Okay. Yeah, so basically that's what we try to do is for so many centuries, for thousands of years, there was a real continuum of elders teaching their kids and their grandkids. And just in the past couple of generations, for the most part, that stopped. And so what we were hoping to do is help bridge that gap right now so that that continuum can keep going and so that's what our work is, is really trying to bridge that gap and get that connection back going again. Next. 
can do it. Hmm? You can do it. Okay, with that, we'd like to say thank you for having us be in this panel. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or if you want to contact, we have our contacts online. And with that, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Twyla and Seth. Um, I, I, we'll open up for questions here in a minute. I did want to um, key folks into um, what we've identified as the transferable lessons and strategies uh, in the case study. Um, and But before, before we get into that, I did want um, you guys to talk for a couple of minutes about one aspect of the, the initiative that you didn't really get into, and that is the how you took um, the analysis of the traditional diet and, and made it real for community members by creating these daily menus and what that process entailed, what those daily menus look like, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't very scientific. So what we did is, you know, we had all this experience of talking to elders and our notes and everything. And so what we just did is we imagined what would a daily menu look like, say the middle of February. And we just drew upon our knowledge and our notes, and we just came up with these menus. Then we ran it by people to see what looked about right. And um, so we made them up, but it was made up on, on all the information we had. And what we, it really brought home is how varied, how many different foods there were to choose from and how it varied throughout the whole year. And that's why we ended up doing eight days per month because we really wanted a representative sample of, how, of the kinds of food that people were eating and how it varied throughout the whole year. So it's really a broad array. We also asked a lot of questions of elders about things like portion size and how they would eat. So for instance, people would usually eat maybe two meals a day but usually they would just be eating a little bit here and there throughout the day because people were always working. So eating habits and portion size were real different. And um, so we're using that to inform, uh, we started working on coming up with diet and fitness plans based on these pre-reservation baselines. But most of the people involved with that are, they're all tribal members, but they're all working in some form of healthcare. And so COVID really put a stop to that. And we're hoping to, as soon as people have time and energy again, to start compiling those fitness plans again. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we, we talk about that in, in, in some more detail uh, in the case study and then also um, in the related resources on the, the case study webpage, there's some uh, links to uh, some additional information about these daily menus. Um, you know. I, I appreciate Twyla mentioning uh, my son and, and how engaged he was in the in the Gloucester, the wood rat hunt uh, during our site visit last year. I think one of the things that I was really struck by is, and, and we highlighted in the case study, is the, the strenuous uh, level of physical activity required to obtain the, 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 um, the various foods that the traditional Western Apache diet encompasses throughout the year. Um, you can't, you can't help but be physically healthy if you um, if you're in a position to practice that diet. Um, I did want to spend a, a couple of minutes going through what we identified as, as not the only uh, transferable lessons and strategies, but five that we wanted to highlight in the case study. And, and the first one is um, food sovereignty for whole, whole bean wellness. And, and both Seth and Twyla already touched on this, but you know, they, they, this project really doesn't approach um, food sovereignty as the end goal. It's really a vehicle through which um, the goal is that tribal members can once again live as vibrant Apache human beings. And, you know, as Seth pointed out, you know, resurrecting the traditional Apache diet and people's practice of that diet requires that they reconnect to their traditional life ways. And, and in so doing, they reconnect to that, that power, uh, the cultural power, the spiritual power, the social power, the power of family and kin and clan. Um, that is all predicated on healthy relationships with the natural world. Um, and, and I'm really struck by the, what Seth you know, discusses, kind of the assets-based frame that that takes on um, in that you know, you're not focusing on all of the symptoms that ail the community. You're not focusing on prevention. Not that those aren't important, but it's, it just, it, it, it's encouraging an entirely different mindset of, we have so much 
um, power at our disposal that we, we can seize if we so choose, and that it's really up to us. Um, the second one is what, I, what we call everywhere information. And uh, I saw this firsthand during our visit out to the tribe last year, um, the, the efforts that Seth and Twyla and, and the many um, other stakeholders that are involved in this project in various varying degrees and capacities across the tribe. And this is everyone from you know, folks that run the substance abuse prevention program to the wellness program, to the language program. So folks working in tribal government and departments to just volunteer tribal members from across the community. Um, there's, a, there's a concerted effort on getting the information out to tribal members in various ways so that they become accustomed to seeing it everywhere they go. Um, they see it um, in you know, the tribal offices, they see it in the um, tribal healthcare um, uh, facility waiting room and in the exam rooms. They can get these calendars that the project makes and put them up in their offices or in their homes. And um, a lot of what Seth and Twyla and others do is, is um, produce these very easy to understand, digestible educational resources that um, come in different formats, can be used in different ways. They can be used in the classroom, they can be used just in kind of general public education in various settings where people tend to gather. Um, another key is meeting people where they are. And you might ask, well, what is that? What do you mean by that? So, for example, with the daily menus, um, you know, it's it's one thing to to lay out for somebody. Okay, if you want to start to re-embrace the traditional Western Apache diet during the month of, month of March, here's some sample menus as Seth described. Um, but it may be that you don't have the ability to obtain or procure all of the ingredients needed to make those those dishes. So, what they do is they provide alternative substitutes that you can you can get in, in a local grocery store that mimic those traditional Western Apache diet ingredients in nutritional content and in form. And so you can sort of you can create sort of a, a similar dish by substituting in um, more easily accessible ingredients. And this is designed to say, look, we we understand that for, for many of you, at least right now, it's not realistic for you because of a lack of transportation. Um, or a lack of, um, you know, just just the ability to to connect with that particular land where that resource might be available to actually get that, and so we're going to try to make it easy for you so you can gradually react reacclimate to to the diet and 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 you know grow your embrace of it over time. Um, the next one is reviving clan and kinship clan and kinship systems through food, and I think they covered this beautifully. Um, it's really not talking about food in isolation, but really educating um, particularly young people uh, about uh, the fact that these things were inseparable once. And, and they're, they're, that inseparability really was a key driver of a, a, um, a feeling of, of wellness, all-encompassing wellness as, as, as an individual Apache person as, and as a member of an Apache community. Um, and so um, I know that one of the things that, that the project has started to do is to um, work with the tribe's uh, language preservation program and its enrollment office to interview Apache elders over the age of 70, to um, deepen um, the research and knowledge about um, the more than 70 clans from which tribal uh, members descend, and then to note each member's clan affiliations on their enrollment cards so that every Apache can learn which clans they belong to and the ancestral places those clans call home. And of course, those places are um, where a lot of these traditional foods reside and you're not gonna go connect with that place as they, as they mentioned without then connecting with the food and understanding that those again are inseparable. And then finally, um, this notion of redefining prosperity or redefining rich, what rich to be rich means. And, um, in the course of my earlier research with the tribe um, and developing an ethno history in collaboration with the elders uh, council there, at San Carlos, uh, about the, an area called Ira Vipa, which is part of the ancestral territory of uh, the Western Apaches and is now just south of the southern boundary of um, the San Carlos Apache Reservation. Um, I interviewed a lot of elders and they talked about this, about how Back in traditional times before the reservation and even into the early decades following the reservation's establishment, 
the notion of what made you rich as an Apache person was very, very different from what it is today for many Apache people. And that's because of all of these colonial policies that, that brought shame to people who, who wanted to go out and gather their traditional foods and said, well, you know, you're only rich if you had the money, you know, the Western capitalism money to go into a grocery store and actually purchase these foods. And so a lot of what they do is consciously geared around trying to flip that script back to traditional conceptions of what, what being a prosperous Apache human being really means and what it doesn't mean. And so those are, those are in shorthand form, uh, some of the, the keys that we think are transferable to other tribal nations and organizations that are engaging in, in tribal food sovereignty efforts is to really think about what is, what is the, the Apache approach, uh, the, the approach of this specific project mean for the work that we're trying to do and how can it inform that work? And so with that, I'd wanna, I wanna open it up for, for questions from our attendees. Um, the first question asks about the community gardens and uh, specifically about whether composting is done in, in conjunction with those gardening projects. Can you tell about Louise's project? Oh yeah, that's Louise. So Ten yeah, years. Hmm? Ten yeah, years. yeah. So there's like four, four or five different gardens going on out throughout the reservation, and some of them do incorporate composting. They work with the healthcare facility and and um, collecting some of their organic matters there and building up their own compost. There's also a wellness program that is building the fences for people that don't have fences or can't acquire a fence on their own, but will help support, help them in supporting their gardens. Working with the tree farm, they're also doing gardening community, uh, family plots out there in their farm. It's a, I don't know how many acres it is, but they, they started a few years back in developing a really nice garden. So a little bit of a distance, but they have a lot of support there also. And you're looking at, like for myself, I'm just, the way I plant, I don't compost. Okay, I'm, I'm throw myself over here. <laughs> okay. I don't compost. I just rotate my land and I don't have much of a land. I have like a tiny little acre in the corner area that I plant near and then subdivision. And I just turn it. And I tell people, you don't have to buy these expensive. They don't have the money to buy it. I'm not going to tell them you should go buy this. Same with going getting these organic matters where the, some of them, they don't have the fuel to go collect these organic matters from different facilities that are donating them, even though it is donated. And for many of them, it's just planting what you know will grow in the land. So a lot of them is knowing their own land, they can plant. A lot of plants that we are experiencing with, not experiencing with, but that I am seeing being grown are drought resistant seeds and being very mindful where these seeds are coming from. If they were crossbred with another seed, how they will do well or not well. So it's just uh, different ways of planting, but it is going. That's the exciting part is seeing that there is a lot of garden and I see that real concern for food security Food secure last year was like, boom, a lot of garden. So this year I'm expecting that to really double. And last year, I believe it was like 160, between 160 and 175 gardens came up. And this year we're expecting that to, to really rise a little bit more. So just, again, myself planting different, everybody has their own way of planting. So I just encourage, if you, if you don't have it, don't go out, out of your way, just work with what you got. and. You know, for myself, prayer. <laughs> Mother Earth will provide. <laughs> Thank you for that, Twilight. Uh, the next question is, um, can you talk about how important uh, speaking your Apache language uh, was and is in, in collecting uh, all of this information, uh, I would assume, particularly from elders, um, in, in developing this project and, and you know, and, and then educating the community about, about all of this information. Yeah, we're both going to answer this one. So I don't speak Apache. I can understand some. I'm, I'm good at understanding the names of things. And so in general, to answer the question, it's really vital to understand the language is the way you can understand the context and the approach of it. 
And for me, my job was to be kind of like a, a human tape recorder and just take the information down. And now I'm gonna let Twyla answer the other part because she's coming at it from the actual real cultural perspective and she can talk about why language is important to it. Well, for language, it, it's beyond this English modern concept of things. And when it's in the language, The only way I can explain it is like is this is whole different thing that people can probably will never understand in this. I can't say it, I'll say it, a white world will not understand that concept, but when you teach it in the language, it brings it life, and it brings back a connection with the land, and who you are as a dead person. So when you're going out there and you hear the creation story in the language is not the same as I hear in this creation story in English. It's two different things that I seriously cannot explain here on this, this screen, but it's something that it's, it's a part of how, how you can say, the only way I'm trying to think of word, experiencing it in that moment and in this place and in these actions is is not um how you can say i'm just trying to think of a word i'll let seth try to say it for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so the only way i can say it, it's it has deeper meaning that science will never understand and that's what makes us unique and that's what makes us beautiful as indigenous people is that there's so much of our culture, our language, or so much of us that is not really tapped into. But we're working on it. We're working on it, and it's helping seeing a lot of people, you know, really, you see a lot of young people, especially young people wanting to learn. They really come to you wanting to learn more. And that's what I love about what we're doing. And we need more of us here. We do, as you can see, it's just us. <laughs> so uh, the next, thank you, thank you, Twyla. The next question um, is is looking to the future. What what do you guys need in terms of support, um, all kinds of support, um, to to grow this initiative, to um, you know, to take it to the to the heights that you've you've always wanted to take it. it well, okay. we were just having this conversation this morning because you know we're always writing grants and trying to get money. And part of the, our project really falls through the cracks in a lot of ways. And one of the big reasons is there's not a direct economic benefit to what we're doing. We're not trying to monetize any part of it. And in fact, we're trying to not monetize any part of it, which Twyla will explain to you in just a minute. So, but what we hope is that when people learn this, it makes them stronger so that they can take care of themselves, not just with eating traditional foods, but it will strengthen their identity and esteem in a way that it gives them the strength to be able to go out in the world and do whatever they need to do to make money. So we're not trying to, in fact, we don't want to turn wild crops into cash crops, quite the opposite, because that would wipe the communities, the wild plant communities out. So what we really need help with is being able to subsidize individuals that want to do what it takes to learn all this information. Twyla and I are getting paid and we need more people to get paid. Normally you would learn all this in the course of your childhood from the time you're born to the age of 15. But now we need to bridge that gap. So we need people to learn it in five years. That's about what it takes to learn the basics of the food. So we need funding to be able to support people to basically become trainees to learn this information in a short amount of time. Maybe you can talk about how it's not good to attach it to money. When, uh, I'm gonna say like how you, how, how can I say this? You, you have these winter birds, they come over and they visit you then you feed them and they're so happy, you know, they eat a little off of here and there, but you leave for them. 
You're not going to tell that bird, oh, you owe me $10. I fed you. You're not going to say that you're so happy to see that bird come and eat, you know, the seed that you're leaving. I feel that's how our project is. We have a seed of knowledge. And there's a lot of people in our community hungry for that knowledge. And we would like to offer to everybody, yes, but there's only two of us. And having extended funding would be phenomenal for this project because I personally see the impact it has on people, especially people that are victims of abuse, sexual violence, that attempted suicide, addiction, alcoholism. I see, I see how this transforms them, this way of teaching. And myself, I'm not, I'm no different. I'm been in that boat and it hurts because a lot of my friends that experience this have committed suicide or have overdosed or have drowned of alcoholism. But we grew up in a different time where people make fun of you for knowing your own culture. You go bring desert food to school, they laugh at you. You do things with grandma, modern society laughed at you. What we're doing is healing and bridging back people so that we don't have to feel this way. We shouldn't be ashamed of who we are and we shouldn't have to feel that pain because society said we were different. And for me, I love what I'm doing. I love being able to touch base with people in the community because we're healing together. And with this type of work, it's, it's, you know, I just see them, they're so happy. They, hey, Twyla, are you guys gonna be going get this? You know, we wanna go. Hey, Twyla, this plant is up. We went and got some, you know, or we cooked this, or we gathered this. And you see that excitement and they talk about how we haven't done this for years. And I remember doing it when my grandma did it. I took my kids, we did this. And it just, for me, that's success. When they try to measure things and, I think for our project, because a lot of these grants ask for these different measurements, we can't give it to them. But we see, I see it, and I call that success. So thank you. Thank you, Twyla. We have we have time for, for one more question. Um, and for those questions that we, we aren't able to get to in our remaining time, we'll, um, we'll follow up with Seth and Twyla and we'll, um, We'll send all the attendees a follow-up email with the link to the webinar recording, as well as um, answers to the questions that were not answered during the webinar itself. I, I wanted to um, make the last question about youth. And um, I think your last response, Twilight, kind of get, gets at this issue, but you know, how do you how do you approach youth who you're trying to um, make understand the importance of them re-embracing the, the traditional food and the traditional life ways associated with those foods um, when they're not being taught that at home? How do, you, how do you get them to understand why this is so important? Um, you don't, you just take them and they learn and they follow. And it's, I, I always say it's a traditional method of education. It's always been hands-on, listening, learning, using your senses. It's never been taught, you need to learn this because of this. It's just seeing their response when taking them out there and their reactions and their feedback. And you get, okay, so in the school system, okay, did a survey in the school system here. The person with the highest amount of interest had a 1.0. That's in the high school. And that's a complete survey with all these students. And the cutoff went to a 2.0 person with a 2.0 average, was the least person had the interest. Everybody else with the 
2.5 and above already had these academic dreams of, you know, going beyond and doing great things, which is great. But you're looking at the low, that down here, you're looking at what's, how do you teach people that, that um, are gonna have struggling time to get into college or get a degree? So this is something that where you're not getting a degree, you're going out and learning and building up yourself so you can feel good about yourself also. And it's not about, um, I'm trying to think, I got so, so many things went in my head really quick. But no one teaches us to be happy. All it says is go and succeed, succeed, make money, make money. It's all about this, this, this status in this so-called America place where this, what we're saying is, gosh, you just wake up to go and forage. You wake up happy just to, oh, we're going to go get acorn. We're going to go to this place and go get this. We're going over here to get berries. We're going to get stuff for the basket for the ceremony. Things that are meaningful to us as Apaches and things that have purpose to us as Apaches, but doesn't value money on those things. And, and you're seeing young people just get so excited. I don't know. I, I think I lost track somewhere of the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you totally answered it. And I think, you know, one of the the coolest parts about putting this case study together was was going through all the images of the young people that you work with um, in the field learning experientially. Um, and that the look of glee on the 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 faces of the the group of young people that had just, you know, succeeded in their wood rat hunt. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get that in a classroom, right? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's the moral of the story. Um, so we're about out of time. Um, you guys are getting some amazing kudos in the chat box. If you, uh, if you have that open and we'll save those for you as well. Um, really appreciate the work you do. And we'll definitely make sure that the attendees um, get all of um, the information that, that NCI has gathered and, and access to you guys and all the information that you have so they can learn more about uh, this approach. Um, here's, here's some uh, links for you guys. As, as Sadie mentioned at the outset, if you're interested um, or have any questions, um, you know, want to learn more about, about this or some of the other case studies we've done or, or any, uh, any other aspects of NCI's work in this area, you can email us at foodsovereignty at nci.org. Um, you can email Sadie or myself, and you can, of course, email uh, Twyla and Seth. And really appreciate you uh, taking time to share with us today. And uh, for the attendees, just know that we're going to be having our next uh, case study webinar here in a couple of weeks with the Osage Nation. So stay tuned for more information from that. And with that, we thank you and have a good day.